Now, having spent all this time, we won't really do much with it. Uh, we will do exactly one thing with it. And this is the one thing that we needed this Maxwell term to do. It's to describe something called electromagnetic wave. It's uh, the question of what happens if I have a charge that's in space and it's oscillating up and down. If I have that, what kind of effect would this produce in the space around it? And before we had this term, what we could do was kind of limited. So you know, if I have an electric charge in space, it's going to produce electric field, right? Yes? Sort of radially going upward. And as this moves, the electric field will change. Big deal, nothing surprising. All right, so we had that from Gauss's law. And you could also describe a charge moving up and down as a current, kind of something analogous to current, right? Current moving up and current moving down. So you could say, oh, that's a current. So based on um, Ampere's law, we could say that generates magnetic field that's going around the loop like this. And as this uh, moves up and down, current is changing, maybe sinusoidally. That changes the magnetic field, maybe sinusoidally. And you could say even up to this much. You could say that changing electric magnetic field will now generate electric field. So this is the picture I was uh, looking up just before class. So this is the picture that you could have gotten so far. You could have said with a charge moving up and down, that generates magnetic field going around in a loop like this. And based on this magnetic field changing, you could say that generates this electric field going like this. Right? And um, that would be where we stop. Uh, without Maxwell term, so I have a changing electric field, but without the Maxwell term, the changing electric field doesn't do anything. So we would say, all right, that's where we stop. No more interesting features. All these things fall down, at, go down as one over r squared, and end of story. With this term, what changes is that this chain of events continue. And this results in something called radiated field. And um, these electric fields that are generated this, this way, they don't go down as one over r squared. They go down as one over r. So, there, the electric field strength actually, yeah, so we'll just stop there because we are going to talk about plane wave where we are going to pretend that they don't change at all. <laughs> um, but so this chain of events starting with here now becomes possible because of Maxwell term. Because of Maxwell term, this changing electric field can produce this changing magnetic field, which can now produce this changing electric field. And, and then you know this goes on forever. And this is what we refer to as electromagnetic wave. And I think I might have just enough time, I have about 20 minutes, to kind of demonstrate that uh, we do have the correct mathematical relationship to suppose that something like this actually happens. So uh, let me set that up. So, um, this is our Maxwell's equation. Um, I'm going to simplify our Maxwell's equation a little bit, but let me um, start from, so you, your textbook tries to do it using this integral form of Maxwell's equations. I, um, so you can look at the textbook for that. I'm going to use the differential form because um, I, it's a lot easier. <laughs> and when you do any kind of serious proof work, that's what people would use anyway. It's uh, in this lower division class where uh, some students may not have taken multivariable calculus that your textbook is forced to use this in, uh, integral formulation. But what's more natural to use is the, it's the derivative formulation. So let me write that down first. So differential form. of Maxwell's equation. I will write them down in the same order so that you can draw some kind of relationship between them. Gauss's law says this, the divergence 
of electric field is equal to the charge density. So you know, with all this differential form, one thing that you should remember is that um, they are local. As in, when you describe electric field at a point, so you are dealing with the derivatives at the point, so you are dealing with the charge density at the point. You get this, you know, enclosed the charge, enclosed current, all this stuff when you integrate over some volume or integrate over some area. So it's going to be charge density divided by epsilon naught and divergence of magnetic field corresponding to this is zero because there's no magnetic charge. Um, and the one corresponding to this is the curl. Curl of magnetic field is, let me write this down including the Maxwell's term. Um, so let me factor out mu naught. It's mu naught times current enclosed will become current density. So let me use the standard symbol J for that. So just as a reminder, the current density J is equal to current divided by area. And I guess the vector thing is the, in the normal direction. Okay. So that's the current density. Plus, uh, we needed this uh, displacement current, except I'm dividing out area anyway. So this is going to be epsilon naught rate of change of electric field. And I can leave the vector term as it is. Um, well, I'll talk about divergence and curl. Um, and the last thing is the curl of electric field. Curl of electric field is given by the differential version of this, which means I get rid of the area. So uh, it'll be minus rate of change of magnetic field. So this is the uh, differential form of Maxwell's equations. And because of the uh, prerequisite slash co-requisite arrangement for this class, I have to ask, um, how many people here are not currently taking or have not already taken Math 3C? OK, so for those of you who have not taken Math 3C, these symbols don't quite mean much. So let me explain this. So the three um, symbols I need to introduce are these. One is what's called um, one is what's called a gradient operator. So gradient operator, and I mean operator sounds fancy, but like a derivative is an operator. It's a differential operator. And gradient operator is the derivative in three dimensions. So let me just write down the symbol. It's represented by this upside down triangle with a little vector thing on top. It's because it's a vector operator. Let me write down um, its form in the Cartesian coordinates. In Cartesian coordinates, this is, so it has three components, x hat, y hat, z hat. So it has, uh, x hat component, y hat component, plus z hat component. And each of these components are the derivative operator, the partial de derivative. So component here is der derivative with respect to x. Component here is derivative with respect to y. Component here is derivative with respect to z. I guess so the one funny thing about operator is that um, this is not a function. This uh, only becomes meaningful when you act on a function with it. This is uh, like a reminder, I am going to take a derivative of what? Whatever function comes after this. That, uh, yeah, so that's something your math class would spend a more proper amount of time. I'll just leave that there. Um, so we do this gradient operator. Um, your calculus class would uh, define two particular types of operation. Or let me write down all three. So I mean, um, so you have the gradient. So gradient is the simple one. It's uh, simply this uh, acting on a function. So a gradient of, let's say, you have a scalar function of position x, y, z. So this could be a function of temperature, right? Temperature is scalar. 
and you can express it as a function of three-dimensional coordinate system. So, so when you take a gradient, then this is the um, what's called a gradient of that function. And it gives you a vector quantity. So like when you talk, think about temperature gradient, temperature gradient has a sense of how quickly it's changing as a function of distance and in what direction it's changing. Okay? So this is so the one operation you can define with this. And the other two operations are, um, I will write it down and I'll tell you that uh, mathematically it's not that complicated from something that you already know. But this is something your math 3C will spend a lot of time trying to build the intuition for that I don't have time for. <laughs> so let me first write it down. The two operations that are defined are what's called diversions and curl. It's uh, two particular type of vector operations. You can do with this vector operator. Think of, it, think of it like, this is like a scalar multiplication. You are multiplying a vector to a scalar, you get a vector quantity, right? So in both of these, I'm going to multiply a vector with a vector. Divergence is where I get a scalar. Curl is where I get another vector. So divergence, does this all sound familiar? Like with the vector operations? What kind of vector operation did you do where you got a scalar? Dot product, right? Yeah, so that's what divergence is. It's a dot product. It looks like a dot product. I mean, there's a little bit of, it looks like a dot product. So it's the gradient operator dot product with some kind of a vector field. So, um, so oh, I, some kind of vector field. So I didn't talk, uh, write down vector field here, so let me write it down here. A vector field A, for example, would it be, it's a functional position, x, y, z, and possibly time, and uh, it'll have a component. It'll have x component, it'll have y component, and it'll have z component. Do you know anything that's like this vector field? Any physical quantity that can be expressed as a vector field? Electric field. Yeah. Electric field and magnetic fields are examples of vector fields. It's, it's a vector quantity that's a function of position, has three components. Um, so this uh, looks like a dot product between two vectors. And when you write it out, it's exactly what that is. When you write it out, uh, let me write it out in Cartesian coordinates so that you can see that it's uh, nothing scary. Um, this dot product, it becomes this. So, you know, it's only the x dot x that doesn't disappear. So when you do this dot product, there's technically like nine different products, right? Between three of these components and three of this component. Of those nine, only three survive. X dot X, Y dot Y, and Z dot Z. The rest go to zero. So you end up with the, the X derivative of AX plus the Y derivative of AY plus the Z derivative of AZ. In the Cartesian coordinate system, all this looks pretty nice. Uh, something that your math 3C would spend a lot of time going over is um, how to do this in different coordinate systems, like a cylindrical and spherical. Those look nasty, and I will not deal with that in this class because I don't have the formulas memorized for once. <laughs> so that's a divergence. Curl um, is the quantity that gives you a vector thing back. And if you remember, the product that gave you a vector back was cross product, right? And um, so this is going to look like this. It's going to look like a cross product. It'll look like uh, this vector operator cross product with the other vector. The only thing that you have to be careful with in this is the order of operation. Not, you know, in the sense of this versus the other way around. Like, you know, A cross 
delta, this means nothing. Like this is not a this is not a curl. Because this is one thing you have to watch out for operators. They have to be coming right in front of something that it's acting on. When you swap the order, you get something entirely different. It's still an operator, it doesn't act it on anything. So when you write down this curl um, operation, you have to be careful in keeping that order same. When you write it down, the derivative always has to come before the, the component. Okay? So uh, this is probably where it's worth, um, um, do people here remember the component representation of uh, cross product? Yes, no? Let me give you a shortcut to memorize it. Um, how many of you have taken math 3E? Linear algebra matrices. Okay, enough of you. And when you take, how many here have heard of determinant? I feel like one de determinant part of pre-calculus. Like there's a little bit of matrix in the college algebra and there you talk about determinants, right? Okay, yeah, so this is based on determinant. This is how you can memorize uh, cross product A cross B. And you know, this is the, really the simplest way to memorize a cross product. You say that A cross B, so um, A would have, so A has component AX, AY, AZ, and B has component BX, BY, BZ. And this A cross B can be represented this way. The short, quickest way to write down the component representation is to say this is equal to a kind of a fake determinant. Determinant of this made up three by three matrix that looks kind of odd. It's, uh, you say it's the determinant of this three by three matrix that looks like the first row is the unit vectors, x hat, y hat, z hat. The second row is the first vector, ax, ay, az. The last third row is the second vector, components of the second vector, bx, by, bz. How many people here remember the shortcut? for calculating the determinant of a three by three matrix. Works only for three by three matrix, doesn't work for anything else. No. Yeah, well, I'll just, yeah, I'm almost out of time, so let me <laughs> wrap up this portion. Um, so the first thing you do is you copy over these two columns so that it looks like a column one, two, three, and then you start repeating, column one, two again. It's, it's a graphical method, so you need to have this as well. Uh, you need these auxiliary figures to help you make the next figure. So you group these terms together this way. So each of your term is going to be product of three symbols. And those three symbols are formed this way you uh, go down diagonally. You can go down to the right, that'll give you these three groupings. This is the diagonal grouping of one, two, three groupings. And with each of these groupings, you associate a positive sign. That's one set of uh, terms you have in the cross product. If you have seen cross product, it looks complicated, right? So these three won't be enough, there's three more. And those other three, you get from diagonal going down to the left. So you have, so these are the three uh, diagonal groupings going down to the left. And with these terms, you associate a minus sign. So there's going to be a total of six terms. Uh, it's usually grouped together by their uh, like terms and unit vectors. So let me write them down that way. And um, 
yeah, let me write them down that way. And that will be the starting place for talking about electromagnetic waves when we come back uh, in the lab section to wrap up this discussion. So, uh, so it will be long, so let me write it down carefully. I am going to write down a group of two terms for the x, one, two terms containing the unit vector x hat and two terms containing unit vector y hat and another two terms containing unit vector g hat. And I'll just uh, um, hunt and pack um, those ones. So I have, so this is x hat. So one of the terms must be a y and b z. That has plus sign with it. So x hat, so plus a y b z. And let me go looking for, here's x hat. So another term must have a z and b y with a minus sign in front, minus a z b y. And this is where I'm going to be super careful. I'm always going to write down A before B. It's because I'm looking forward to this, where I need to always write down the derivative before the thing I'm differentiating. I can never swap that order. So, I mean, yeah, so, all right. So Y hat, let me go more quickly. A, G, and B, X. A, G, B, X, that's the positive sign. Y hat here, A, X, B, Z, that's minus sign minus a x b z and the last term uh, a x b y minus a y b x and there is actually a pattern to this uh, something called the cyclical versus anti-cyclical permutation that you can actually use that to memorize but this is the quickest way that um, depends on something that you are supposed to know already. <laughs> so let me write this down and we'll wrap up there. So, um, so the curl is essentially cross product of this vector and this vector. And as I write down, I'm going to refer to that um, thing that I just built up so that I can say curl is all right, the y component of the first, or uh, I'm looking at the x component <laughs> of the result of the curl first. And for that x component, I look at the y component of first vector. So the derivative with respect to y, and the g component of the second vector, so derivative with respect to, um, I guess, y of the g component of the a, so a sub g minus g component, derivative with respect to g, of the y component, the y component of a function. You see there's a lot of moving parts that you need to um, keep them separate. You cannot get different components mixed in, because there's three different components to keep track of. Uh, y component of the curl would be, all right, uh, G component, so the derivative with respect to G of X component, so A sub X, the function, minus the derivative with respect to X, X um, of the A G function. You might begin to notice some um, similarities, as in each component happens only once in any term. X, Y, Z, X, Z, Y. Um, y, Z, X, Y, X, Z. And you, know, you can use that to make sure you didn't make a mistake. The last term is the G component, this one here. So X component of the first vector. So derivative with respect to X of the Y component, so of the function A, Y, minus derivative with respect to Y, of the x component, ax. So this complicated expression is what's called a curl of a vector field. And the reason I need to introduce this is to tell you about um, how 
Maxwell's equation says, what Maxwell's equation says about curl of magnetic field or electric field. Good, um, so I guess that's all we have time for for the afternoon session. Uh, when we come back for lab, so it's gonna be just a two hour lecture. Um, and what we'll spend time on that is uh, one, deriving the uh, wave equation for electromagnetic waves. And we'll look at some property of, properties of electromagnetic wave as much as we have time for. But once again, the only part that you are responsible for in the final exam is really up to the displacement current and the complete representation of uh, Maxwell's equations. The rest are sort of what I want to talk about, but I can not really test you on. I'll be testing you on, you know, on physics 4C if you take physics 4C here. <laughs>